know when it comes on. Okay. It says live. I love <laughs> you know I love this technology. This is great fun. It's live. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everybody and you are now watching Momovation TV. My name is Leah Segedy, also known as Spooky Boo on Twitter. So, um, the Google changed their, they totally changed their back end. And you know, whenever things change on me, they totally change their back end. And when things change on me, I get a little weird because I feel like I'm a little, ah, things are going crazy. I have to learn something. So, um, as I'm trying to fix everything, and, and, and mute everybody's microphone so I don't hear myself ten times. Um, looks like, Greg, I'm going to have to mute you, too. I'm going to unmute you, too. I'll come back to you right. for a second. Joanna, can you mute your microphone? Because it keeps unmuting. It's not that I don't love you, girl. It's that I keep hearing myself think. Okay, so we have an awesome show today. It's all about urban farming and sustainability. Now, this is a really, 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 really super cool topic and a really, really well-timed topic because, of course, we are knee-deep in the food movement here in Mama Nation. We are like, all of us are queens of Twitter health causes. Um, we're really good at pinpointing causes and just diving into them and, and educating as many people as possible on Twitter and then with the show and then with the campaign. And so farming is something that we've done a lot and a lot, a lot of, you know, focusing on in the past year, ever since Prop 37 in California, which, by the way, I am, yes, I, you yes. know what, I don't have to really do this because I, I know, okay, from what I've heard is that it is so close, it's literally within the mar margin of error, and that's what the polling said, I believe, mm -hmm. last week. So tomorrow is going to be when Washington State decides whether they want their food labeled or not. Now, I'm hoping they want their food labeled because the people of Washington are pretty badass. I mean, they have, they have passed some pretty progressive laws up there, and they're really open to those types of things. And to be quite honest, like, come on. How open, open and progressive do you have to be to just want more information about what you're eating? And like being able to choose, make decisions, that's pretty libertarian too. So we know that across the aisle, Republicans, Democrats, independents, whoever, religious affiliation, it doesn't matter who you are, what color skin you are, pretty much everybody wants to know what's in their food. And so we're praying, hoping and praying, that tomorrow is the day that it all goes down in Washington. I have a lot of friends up there because I know a lot of friends, I know a lot of people working on that campaign. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> I got, I, I'm twitching, I'm, I'm, I want to be with them, but I got, I got small kids, just like last year, um, I got small kids, so I'm here, and um, I'm with you guys, and so let's keep our fingers crossed, hopes, prayers, good vibes to, to I-522 in Washington, tomorrow is the beginning of the rest of the movement, is what I have to say, because no matter what happens tomorrow, Basically, what's going to happen is end game. I mean, because we even know that there's been closed door meetings with the food industry, and the food industry has just said, look, we give up. Let's just figure out a way to do this so that we have some control over it. That's what they want right now. So if, they, if we don't win in Washington, they're probably going to end up going to the feds within a couple of years and saying, hey, look, we can't stop this movement because it's coming from the people, and it's getting too big. And the more we fight it, the bigger it grows, which is basically what's going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of how much time, energy, and money do they want to put into the pot? Because every time they put another $40 million into the pot, that's another $40 million to broadcast to the world that there's something called the GMO that people didn't know about before. So the more money they spend, the more awareness it creates, and the bigger the movement gets. So again, it's just a matter of how much time and money do they want to waste? Now, I'm sure the GMA would like to waste all of their time because you know they're making lots of money doing this and, and getting a lot of, well, you know, they get to, you know, run around the country and, and, and try to play God everywhere. So it's really interesting how they can um, get voters to vote against their own interests by creating advertising that's so incredibly false, makes me crazy. Well, that's just because I come from politics. I know it happens all the time. But uh, anyways, okay. 
so I was I was saying so tonight's topic is about well having a garden or farm backyard farm in your own home okay so we have a really 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 cool guest tonight his name is Greg Peterson and he comes from now check this out ladies urbanfarm.org okay so and if you also can check them out on Twitter, it's The Urban Farm. Or you can check them out on Facebook at The Urban Farm as well. And so what is The Urban Farm? Well, I mean, when I first learned about this, I was just like, oh, you mean there's someone that does this? How cool is that? He has a backyard farm, uh, like a farm in his home. And he teaches people how to do this. This is like... This is like bleeding edge of the food movement, and I love it so much because people like Greg can teach us all about what he does. And I gotta tell you guys, I'm not expecting any of you to go home tomorrow, or you're already you're already home, but to go tomorrow and start up an entire farm. But I want him to inspire you to do just a little bit more than you have right now. Now, what I told Greg before he's gonna come on the show is he already knows, he already knows that I got chickens this March. I'm getting lots of chick. I'm getting a lot, a lot, a lot of eggs, and then all of a sudden nice. now my my eggs kind of slowed down a little bit. I think it's cause probably it's getting a little cold, and one of them I think is I'm not mulching, but the feathers are coming off. One of one of my chickens. I'm learning, and the and the other day I got an egg that was this big, and I looked at it, and I was like. <laughs> I have no idea what that's about because I'm not a farmer. But, you know, I'm sure Greg can tell us all about why I have one itty-bitty little bitty tiny egg that I don't want to crack just because it's so cute. <laughs> and, um, you know, why my my, my uh, chickens, their feathers come off sometimes or just one of them. Um, he also has these four really cool books that we're going to be giving away. So if you guys go to momovation.com and go to that post, go, go all the way down to the bottom. There's four really cool books. One of them is Grow Wherever You Go. The other one, a little mini one, is Foul Play, which I will be reading a lot of. The other one is My Ordinary Extraordinary Yard, which I will be reading as well. And How Green Am I, Greg? Another thing that you're going to be so proud of me for. Yeah, tell me. We have solar panels. Yay. And we produce so much solar energy that Edison is going to owe us money at the end of the year. But then my husband decided to go and plunk down $400 at the Home Depot and get more lights for Christmas. So we might come out even. <laughs> but I, I'm at a zero. I'm at a. I'm. I'm. A, I'm at neutral right now neutral, with my energy. Good. Makes me happy. Well, right now they owe me money, but oh, nice. I, nice. I don't think that's going to happen because. It's going to be like Clark Griswold and the you know National Lampoon's <laughs> Christmas here pretty soon, um, because we have that many lights. But, anyways, okay. So that there's that, and then I also um, we compost. But what I realize is all the extra food I end up giving to the chickens. I don't even get to compost right. it, yep. <laughs> which yeah, is really chickens, cool. Yeah, the chickens yeah. are your composters. Now, Greg, I'm going to let you take over because I, I think I'm just like just bursting with questions. And I would, what I would love for you to do is introduce yourself, introduce your home and what you do and all the education. And then, you know, just start talking and go into things that you think are really super interesting. And then I'll, I'll bust in with some questions. Does that sound okay? Sure. Now, you're a big man. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Far out. <laughs> or what I usually say is farm out. So, <laughs> Yeah, so my house is a third of an acre right in north central Phoenix, so right in the middle of Phoenix. Um, <clears throat> and about uh, 22, 23 years ago, I did a permaculture design course. Are you familiar with the term permaculture? No. I like to call it the art and science of working with nature. It's a whole design methodology um, by which we look to nature to see how we can design um really the nat natural spaces around us and how to grow our food more naturally. Um, and when I found permaculture, it was like, woohoo! It was like so perfect. It's, it really talked to sustainability and what, you know, what I'd been thinking about and doing for basically most of my life. Um, so the urban farm is a third of an acre. That's 80 feet wide and 160 feet deep. Um, there's about 70 fruit trees on the property. Um, yeah, we get them packed in there pretty tight. I love fruit trees. In fact, my goal for many years has been to plant enough fruit trees so that I have fruit every month of the year. 
and yeah, and we're pretty yeah, we're pretty much there. Um, uh, there are three different kinds of solar panels on the roof. So we do uh, solar hot water, solar air heater, and then the photovoltaics. That's the one that makes um, electricity for you know for your house. That's the ones you have. Um, that's you know, and that's a really important one to have as well. And then we do rainwater and gray water harvesting on the wow. property. Plus, plus I have uh, uh, you know, plus I have a nice amount of chickens there. Um, also, in the past couple of years, we've learned how to grow and butcher our own chickens for meat because um, there's uh, laying chickens um, and then there's meat birds um, oh. so I you know I went through that process I wanted to learn it I wanted to understand because I'm not a vegetarian right right um, I have a girlfriend really, that does that too yeah she says that they're a little tougher if you wait until after they're done laying if you if you grab those chickens you have to right. cook them for a really long time yeah they're pot stew chickens Stew chicken. So, um, and re and so about ten years ago, in two thousand one, two thousand two, I started opening up the urban farm for the public to come and see. So you know, and they there were times, literally, there were times in two thousand one, two thousand two, that on the first Saturday of, of every month, I would be waiting on the front porch, twiddling my thumbs for people to arrive, and they never arrived. Aww. That's okay. You know what? It's it's part of the process. Now, when we do a tour of the place, and we give about six a year, um, six days a year. Now, when we give a tour of the place, we have to offer tours multiple times on the same day, um, because we usually get between two and three hundred people at a tour. Wow. Um, and I do I do the tours for free, uh, and then I just put a basket out and say, you know what? If this was worthwhile to you, drop something in the basket. And that model of education. It it continues to blow me away um, at how ex how well that works. You know, people will show up and they're they're inspired and they, you know, they want to go do it themselves. Um, and you you mentioned something a moment ago. You said, um, you know, we want we want people to be farmers. Well, let's let's distinguish that a little bit. So being a farmer is actually quite simple. Do you raise your own food? Okay. Share it with somebody. Oh. There you Just go. Just like that. Just like that. Well, that's pretty because easy because you know we do that with lemons and all kinds of other things. Right. That's what farmers used to do, right? So right. really, that's what I encourage people to do: is grow some food, share it with somebody. That gets us in the process, and that really simplifies it. And here's here's the other thing I tell people: the most expensive thing to buy in the grocery store are herbs, and they're the simplest to grow. Right, growing basil and oregano and thyme, you know, all your fresh herbs are so simple. Get a pot, put a, you know, get a little pot, put it out on your, you know, on your front or back porch, and grow some herbs. Um, you know, there's nothing like fresh basil in your caprese salad. Right. Good so stuff. that's really, in a nutshell, what the urban farm is. Um, what I do, um, and I actually do this. You asked me if I did this full time, and was it a nonprofit? Um, I actually did start a nonprofit here in Phoenix, Arizona. It's called the Valley Permaculture Alliance, um, and it's quite a big one. They have uh, um, three quarters of a million dollar a year budget. Um, so I did do the nonprofit thing once, and it was um, an arduous process. Mm -hmm. uh, so about five or six years ago, I decided that I, you know, that I turned that over to the board, and now I do this. As, for a living, I educate for a living. I actually teach at Arizona State University a class called Sustainable Food and Farms, um, and I offer classes. You can check out my calendar um, on urbanfarm.org. Um, here in the next couple of weeks, we will actually be offering webinars on different urban farming topics on how to keep chickens, how to make your house more energy efficient. I've been doing some on keeping urban fruit trees and what's an urban fruit tree look like and you know how does you know how, how do you make an urban fruit tree because they're different than rural fruit trees. You know, it's just it's a different thought process in order to get that done. Do so. you utilize those um, hyd 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 hydropon what are the hy hydroponic? Yes, with the with the little fish in them and stuff. Do you do those uh, as well? Okay, so that's a process called aquaponics. 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 Okay. You're raising fish, and then using the fish water to uh, water or hydroponically water your plants. So the fish put manure, fertilizer in the right. water, so that the plants pull the pull that manure or the fertilizer out of the water and that's what they grow on. If you want to see a really cool project, um, there's a guy out in Mesa 
Um, it's at gardenpool.org. And what he did is he took his swimming pool, he put a greenhouse over it, he raises fish in the deep end, and in the shallow end, he does hydroponic gardens. It is the most, I know, it's the most fascinating thing. I love what he's done with that. So gardenpool.org, go check him out. He's great. I'm going to, that's awesome. So I heard that it, if the, one of the fish dies, God forbid, you have to get him out really quickly before he yeah. messes with the water because they could yeah. poison the water, essentially. Yeah, essentially what happens is is that uh, um, the any dead matter in there starts breaking down very quickly, um, and the more it breaks down, the more toxic the water gets and the more fish that would die. So yeah, gotcha. you want to make sure. It, uh, doing uh, aquaponics like that, it, it, it's, it's a project. I mean, you're growing food. Um, and you need to pay attention to it. Um, there's another thing that I've recently started playing with. It's called a tower garden. For those mm. of you that know about Juice Plus, um, tower gardens are incredible. They're um, about six foot tall, and it's a aqua. It's a hydroponic growing system where the water is pumped from a basin at the base up this tower, and you've got this great big old long tower um, mm -hmm. that um, you grow food up the side. It's really cool. So there's, you know, yeah. there's, go ahead. That's cool. Do we, do you, can you put it inside or does it have to be outside? Um, you could put it inside. You'd have to put lights on it if you're going to put okay. it inside. Because, you know, anytime you're going to grow food, um, you need to, you know, provide some kind of light so that they can photosynthesize. So when you, okay, so when you're growing food, it doesn't really matter if it's inside or outside. You just need some sort of light. I mean, because yeah. I, for some reason, thought that there was a difference between, you know, the light that I turn on in my house and, and the sun, for some reason. There is. There is. That's the whole color spectrum piece. And, yeah, there definitely is. And you, you it takes a particular kind of light, you know, some of those expensive ones your hubby bought. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a particular kind um, if you're going to grow you know, grow your own food. If you're going to grow your own food on the inside. So inside. what kind of things do you have right now in your backyard that are actually, uh, you know... Nice. So uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, we're in the desert, and, and you are too. Mm -hmm. um, you can probably grow food 12 months a year where you're at. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we're just going into the fall season, um, and the fall season in Phoenix, Arizona is uh, brassicas, so uh, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, those kinds of things, all your greens... Uh, mm -hmm. Lettuce, spinach, kales. I have all kinds of kales growing. Um, get your ga garlic planted out now. Snow peas are coming in. Um, carrots, beets, uh, those kinds of things are, are uh, yeah, what we're planting now and, and growing voraciously. So if I wanted to plant something, let's say there's people watching and they want to plant something tomorrow, okay? Uh -huh. What if they're living in our type of area? What could they plant, and then what other type of area in the in in the United States could they plant? Well, it depends where you're at. Um, in the colder climates, um, you know, east and north, um, they're going into snow time, and so there, there's not much to plant. Um, you know, interestingly enough, at urbanfarm.org on the front page, I. I give away a free planting calendar. You just download it. Oh, great. Um, yeah, it's a desert planting calendar. Um, you know, so that would be good for San Diego and L.A. and, um, you know, New Mexico and Arizona. Nevada um, and all those places. Yeah, the desert, you know, the desert places. Um, so what I suggest people do is, tip, if you're in Arizona, go to urbanfarm.org and download the planting calendar. Um, if you're in other places, um, check with the Cooperative Extension. Um, the Cooperative Extension Office is a uh, function of each state has one, and they'll have a planting calendar for you to let you know what to plant when. That's great. And so you were saying a, a little bit about um, fruit trees and how, oh. how much you love fruit trees. Why don't you talk trees. to me a little bit about them and, and, and how you started planting them and you know how it expanded and what, and what you have now. All right, I can do that. So um, I planted my first, tree, first fruit tree actually in 1976. Wow, that was before yeah. I was born. I was I was in the eighth grade at the time, so I was like twelve or thirteen years old, and we had just moved into the Weldon House. The mm -hmm. Weldon House was my childhood house that I grew up in, and it was a big property, about a half an acre. Um, and my mom 
pointed out to the backyard one day and she says, see, see the backyard, Greg? That's your garden. Go start digging. So <laughs> that's when I got lit up about growing food for whatever reason. Um, I actually, in, interestingly enough, in the eighth grade, which was 1975 for me, I also wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. Mm -hmm. Now, how does an eighth grader know that? I think Jacques Cousteau probably had something to do with it. But I was, <laughs> I was interested back then about how our food system really wasn't working. You know, we have, we've had a broken food system for a very long time. So I planted my first fruit tree in 1975, um, and by 1978 I had all these peaches. Wow. What does a 17-year-old do with peaches, right? So I said, to my, I said to a buddy of mine one day, I said, you know what, I really want to know how to um, can and oh, he look said, at you. Oh, my mom will teach you. So I learned how to can from Tim's mom. <laughs> I love it. You know, at 17, you know, it's like, what do you do with right. all these peaches? So, you know, we had to can them. So that's, you know, I have a deep, long history of fruit trees. Um, and in 1999, I actually got a wild hair and I decided that I was going to plant myself. I was going to plant 500 fruit trees in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Wow. Um, and so uh, I started looking around. I called some of the nurseries, and uh, you know I was looking for a discount. It's like you know, dudes, I want to buy 50 trees. No, nope. sorry, can't do it. So I actually tracked down Dave Wilson Nursery. They're up in uh, uh, near Sacramento, mm -hmm. and they said, yeah, we'd be glad to sell you fruit trees. No problem, wholesale. You know, no problem. You got to order a hundred at a time. Uh -oh. <laughs> So I actually placed my first fruit tree order in 1999. I bought 100 trees. I had no idea what I was going to do with them. I had no idea. Remind me I of the city of Los Angeles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just knew that I wanted to plant fruit trees. Well, something very interesting happened. First of all, um, the more I learned, because in 1999 is when I really dove in and learned a lot about how to grow fruit trees in the city because it's very different. We want to keep them small because we typically don't have a whole lot of room in our yards. Mm -hmm. And if we put in one large peach or apple tree, we're going to get three or four or five or a thousand pounds, three or four or five hundred, a thousand pounds of fruit all at once. Right. And what, what do you do with that? What right. do you do with that? Plus a fruit, you know, a peach at the top of a 30-foot peach tree is a bird food. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> right? Right? So what we do is we actually keep them small. Okay. That okay. makes sense. You want to keep a, you know, a perfect size fruit tree is eight feet tall and six feet wide. So because when you, you say urban, you're also talking about places like where I live, you know, in the outskirts oh, yeah. of the city. Not, you know, not, mm -hmm. you, you would say like, a, ha, get a big, huge fruit tree if you live on an acre, right? Or something like that, or you have that much. Well, if you want, here's the deal. A big, huge fruit tree, you got to harvest. So you got to figure mm -hmm. out how to get up there, and you know, if you got kids and they're going to climb the tree, you know, like I used to do, right. that would work. That would work, right? But so it's basically it's a term called urban orcharding, and so I teach urban orcharding, and it's about keeping the trees small. The, there's two big reasons to keep them small. Reason number one is the trees are easier to manage, they're easier to prune, and they're easier to put tool over, net. Netting right. over, but I use tool, T-U-L-L-E, the stuff they make tutus out of. Um, so they're easier to manage, but they also, uh, by doing it this way, we can plant more different kinds of trees. So we can actually plant six different varieties of peaches that will give us peaches from mid-May to mid-August. So now we have a six-foot tall tree that's giving us 20 pounds of peaches every two weeks. Wow. You can manage 20 pounds of peaches, can't you? Well, yeah, you put them in cans. Yeah, well, you can them. You, you know, uh, it, it's not 200 pounds of peaches. Right. It's 20 pounds of peaches. And 20 so you get it. Right. So that that's really the whole notion behind behind the ur urban orcharding. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you do the peaches have to be close by to each other to produce more? So I read something on my little thing where mm -hmm. it was saying if you crossbreed or cross with some other cross pollinate, breed, cross pollinate. Thank you. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? I absolutely can. So the, the really the notion that you're talking about is something called self fertile. Do do trees need a either a male tree or a, um, a another kind of tree? Um, most fruit trees, all the fruit trees that I talk about. Um, mm -hmm. are self-fertile. 
Okay? Which means you can plant an Anna apple tree here in you know in Arizona, and you know three years later you'll be getting apples. Okay, that's called self-fertile. Um, the cherries that we sell, um, there's one two kinds of cherries that actually do pretty well here in the desert. Um, they need you need one of each, so they're not self-fertile. Mm, okay. So the other big thing that's really started propelling me forward on this project back in 1999 was I. You can go into nurseries, and this just irks me. And still today, you can go into a nursery, and they will sell you a fruit tree that will never make fruit. No way. Way. Really, seriously. In fact, one of my clients went in to a local nursery here in Phoenix, bought a peach tree took it home, planted it, this was he before he was a client of mine, took it home and planted it, brought me the tag from it, and I said, dude, that's never going to make fruit. And, I, and this was like six months ago. And, you know, you go into the Home Depots and the Walmarts of the world, and there's, you know, it's just what corporate sends them. So the thing here is, is it's called chill hours. So here in Phoenix, Arizona, we get about 350 hours of chill every winter. Mm -hmm. okay. If we plant a 700-hour chill peach tree, it will never make fruit. It will never make fruit. If you plant it in that chill hour, right? Well, chill or hours chill are time. anything. Yeah, ch chill hours are anything under 38 degrees. Okay. 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 So we only get 350 hours of chill from November to Jan February here. Right. Which isn't right. very many chill hours. Okay. So for your listeners out there, if they're planting fruit trees, they um, and this is the deciduous ones, the ones that lose their leaves, so peaches, apples, stone fruit, that kind of stuff, um, they need to make sure they know how many chill hours they get where they live and what the chill hours are of that tree that they're buying. Oh, that wow. is so, 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 so important. So um, I just bought a fig tree a couple, fig trees are four, fine. four weeks ago, yeah. and the... <laughs> All the leaves just fell off of it recently. Yeah. All right, so interesting. Okay, great that you asked that. That's a great question. Those are deciduous fruit trees, so figs, pomegranates, uh, apples, peaches, apricots, plums, nectarines, all of those almonds are, and, and all actually all the nut trees as well, they're deciduous trees, which means they lose their leaves in the wintertime. So when it gets cold, they lose their leaves. It's just part of the process. So don't That's, freak out. So don't freak out. I had, a, I had a lady a few years ago call me up in like November, and she said, oh, my God, Greg, my apricot tree's dying. It's losing all of its leaves. It's like, no, it's just going dormant for the winter, and it'll be just, you know, all along about February 15th or March 1st. You know, you, you'll get all those nice little buds that pop out, and you'll be good to go. So... Okay, that's great to know. Can you plant, okay, so these urban planting, do you recommend people to plant them in the ground or in pots? Um, well, in the desert here, in the in the ground. Okay. It's hard to grow anything in pots here in, in the desert southwest. I mean, it gets up to, you know, it gets up to 120 degrees in, in the summertime here. Can you um, do fruit ever in pots? I mean, is that possible? Or is it not... They just don't like it in a pot. Yeah, I mean, because I have just, a bunch of ones in pots because we got no, no room in the ground. Yeah. Um, bigger the pot, the better. Um, you know, okay. how hot does it get there in the summertime? It can get up to 100 degrees, but it's not like that all the time. I mean, it's right. only one month a year when it does that. Right, exactly. Most of the time, Here, it's like 80. Yeah. You know, uh, here's what I tell people. Growing food is one great big grand experiment. Hmm. You know, right. experiment, jump in, see what works for you. Go experiment, go play. Um, every year I plant new fruit trees here in Phoenix. I plant them because, you know, I want to try something new. Right. That's awesome. Okay, so tomatoes. What's your best tip on tomatoes? Mm. Not to leave them on the ground so the roly-polies get them. Right. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> tomatoes, you know what we call in, in in the gardening industry, we call a tomatoes the gateway drug to gardening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and people are so willing easy. to spend people are willing to spend great big money on uh, on growing tomatoes. Um, so my tip for you is going to be don't spend a lot of money. Don't spend, don't spend a lot of money. You could you can literally you could literally um, 
spend three, four, or five hundred thousand dollars on setting up your garden. If you're doing that, that's crazy talk. That's just mm -hmm. crazy. Figure out a simple way to do it. My simplest garden is I take. Um, so my friend Jan called me a couple of years ago, and she had a um, east-facing garden at her house. And, you know, there was nothing growing in it, and there was also no Bermuda grass, so that's one of our noxious weeds here. Um, East-facing is good because it gets sun from uh, sun up to noon, and then the garden's in the, in the shade in the afternoon. So for here in the desert, that's the best place to have your garden. And um, all I did with her garden is I brought about 14 cubic feet of organic topsoil or compost. Essentially, it was just compost. Um, I put a three-inch layer throughout an entire garden. I didn't dig, and I planted the seeds. Oh, wow. Just, just like that. Just like that. Make it so simple because here's the deal. Everything that's going to be growing, it's going to be doing the digging for you. Mm, okay. You know, let those roots. Do, you know, let those roots do the work. You don't have to do the backbreaking work. I'm a lazy gardener, man. I like to. You know, the la the lazier I can get away can with. Can someone this stuff, tweet the that? I'm a lazy gardener, I'm man. A lady, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me. Um, Said you know, by so, at the urban farm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, tomatoes. Uh, so tomatoes are finicky. Um, you know they're 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 probably the hardest place to start. Mm. Um, believe it or not, you know the easiest thing to grow are radishes, carrots, beets, um, lettuce. You know those kinds of things. Um, tomatoes don't like extreme heat, mm. so um, they stop. Sense. Yeah, they stop producing. For us, they stop producing tomatoes in June. And they take a lot of water. And they a take a fair, they take a fair amount of water. Yeah. Yeah. Nor do they like the cold. So here in Phoenix, here in Phoenix, we have about a three-month window in the spring and a three-month window in the fall to grow tomatoes. So, wow. yeah, so specifically to tomatoes, just, you know, tell your listeners, again, check with the Cooperative Extension. Um, the Cooperative Extension in most states offers something called the Master Gardener Program. Mm -hmm. um, go do the Master Gardener Program. If you want to really learn this stuff, go do the Master Gardener Program. Um, but they also, part of the Master Gardener Program is that they um, offer, vol you have to do volunteer work. So you're doing this volunteer work, uh, and people like me or you, we can call in and say, you know what, I've got this ha 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 problem. You know, can you help me solve it? So they have a they have a, a you know a phone number that you can call to get help with stuff like that. So um, you know specifically for your area, if you're interested in you know tomatoes, then call them. They're going to know exactly what to do with it. So you were talking a little bit about rainwater versus gray water harvesting. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that? Because I'm, I'm everyone knows what rainwater is, but gray water right. not everybody understands. Right. So um, let's talk about the harvesting part first. Okay. Okay. So rainwater, it, there's, there's actually three different kinds of water that are available to us. Rainwater, storm water, and gray water. Okay. So um, rainwater is basically what falls out of the sky on your property. Storm water is what's running in the street by your house. Okay. That we can, it can definitely be harvested. And gray water is any water that comes out of your tap and goes down any drain in your house except your toilets and uh, your kitchen sink. Okay. And in Arizona it's legal to use um, it's legal to use gray water in your yard to, as for land, watering your landscape. Oh, okay, that makes sense. You okay. just don't drink it. You, you just don't drink it. That's right. You just I think it, you there's know, places you're... in California we do the same thing cuz they have to put signs that say don't drink the water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the states are getting smart to that. It's like you know, we can be taking you know, because like seventy percent of the water that goes down your drain is gray water. Yeah, and we you just know, use it use it in your landscape. You have to figure out how to get it into your landscape. I get this question a lot. People want to put in rainwater and gray water harvesting systems and put mm -hmm. tanks in. The problem with first of all, the problem with gray water is if you store it, it turns bl to black water and smelly real quick. Oh. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, and once you start putting tanks in the ground, 
it gets very expensive. Tanks are expensive. Um, mm -hmm. So I highly encourage, it's rainwater and gray water harvesting. And, and what we do in permaculture is we actually direct that water into different places in our landscape, put it on the plants that are there that use it when it's put there. Okay. Okay. So rather than actually store, rather than storing it in a container somewhere, you're storing it in the ground. So <laughs> I I often use gray water and rainwater to water the fruit trees. Excellent. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah. Water the fruit trees. That's the you know that's the best thing to do with it. Fantastic. So you were also talking um, a little bit about. Um, oh, I have notes here. Seasonal. Seasonal things with water. Uh huh. So, so how does this work? I mean, you guys are in the Arizona desert. I yep. don't know quite what it's like in the Arizona desert. I think I've been to Arizona six times, but it's always been in the airport. I've never been outside oh, yeah, the airport. Yeah. Think, think hell. <laughs> think hell. Think hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a know, little bit hotter than that. <laughs> it's a little bit hotter than that, exactly. Um, it gets, you know, pretty much from about. June, uh, probably May 1st. We can get 100 degree temperatures from May 1st um, to October 1st. How do you grow May, things in June, that July, heat? August, That's September, insane. Like five months a year. We just um, have like do you shade things. Like yeah, with yeah, it's a process. You you know I what I do is I plant shade. So rather than building shade, building up a shade structure, I love planting grapes. Love right. planting grapes for shade. Look at you. Yeah. So, you know, you start, you have to, what I do is I design and install edible landscapes. I teach people how to make their yard edible. Right. Wait, you design those things? Yeah. You de my husband, I'm trying to talk my husband into making our front yard yes, edible. Yes, definitely. Yes. Now, front yard this, gardens. Right. Okay. Now, I had to, okay, just to broach the subject with him. His jaw dropped down to the ground, and he said, you want me to what? He's mm -hmm. all, but my grass. And I'm like, sweetie, we've been going California anyways. We're, we're already moving the plants over. You know, why don't we just grow food? That's like efficiency right there, okay? Mm -hmm. And so what I had to do, I'm, I'm trying to get him a step and step closer. So what, what he's realized is that if we put up a white picket fence in front of that, then everything behind that won't be so crazy to him. So I'm trying oh, to get right, the white picket go. fence up. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Because then there's this barrier, right? And he's all, right. can we have some flowers in front of my picket fence? Yes, sweetheart, we can. Okay, whatever you want. Your so hubby can wants think, flowers, that's cool. I don't know why. I think it's just he doesn't want to be one of those people, and I don't know uh, what he thinks those people, people are, are because we really don't even have them anywhere close to us, you know. Yeah. So he doesn't he doesn't see what the cool urban gardens are like because he never sees them. Mm -hmm. We're pretty much it in my neighborhood, you know. So. All right. And, and that's a sad thing because we're in Simi Valley and we have farms like literally 15 minutes from us. So I, right. but I think it's like this is my house. That's a farm. I think that's what. That's why. And see, yeah, that's that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to put those two concepts together. Get people growing their own food. And the best way to do it is put your farm in your front yard. Yeah. I'm put the, your farm in your front yard. There. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. I have a large patch of grass in the front yard at the urban farm and in the backyard at the urban farm. And what I did is I used the perimeter of the property for fruit trees and for gardens. Look at you. So you can still have grass. I like grass. I'm, you know, I'm barefoot. If I'm in the yard, I'm in my bare feet. Okay? Awesome. And, you know, I like the grass. So um, there is, in the front yard at the urban farm, there is a patch of grass that's probably 20 by 60, 20 by 50. Okay. So, Do you have a picket fence or is it all just open? No, no. actually, you know, what I did is I used, remember I said I had like 70 fruit trees in the ground at the urban farm? Right. Yeah, so there's 43 of them in the front yard at the urban <laughs> farm. And what I did is I lined the sides and the front with a hedgerow of fruit trees. So across the front of the urban farm are 14 navel oranges. That It's the street. It's a hedgerow of navel oranges and then my yard. Well, the, the fruit trees are in my yard. but So they're, a, they're actually fencing the front yard. So I have That's this awesome. nice privacy fence that runs across the front of the, front of the property. 
That's awesome. Can we yeah. get you to talk to my husband just a little bit? Or I sure. might just call you to have you plan out our front yard. He was all like, well, we have to get this done nice. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Of course you do. Well, Absolutely I mean. Absolutely, you have to do that nice. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know what? One of the things I do is I do garden consults, and I've taken to starting uh, to doing them on the phone just like this, uh, sitting in front of Google Earth. Oh, Fantastic. I just do a, you know, I do a look down on top of your house, and in 45 minutes, we can we can do some pretty serious planning. Now I have to even think. I don't even know which way I'm facing. Too. I think our yard faces north. Uh huh. All right. I think it faces north. We get a lot of sun, but not. Then it probably. But not to our. But I have a red door because there's no direct sun on my on my door. Oh, all right. But oh, yeah, I you're think, probably are facing. I think, but it's probably north something, but I'm really yeah. bad with... <laughs> Here's the sun. Where the <laughs> hell am go. I? <laughs> Don't there ever get go. lost with me, right? Are you, like, you I'm the other... me. I can get lost really... Well, you, okay, but I'm the one that, you know, Leah, read a map, and I have to move the map to where I am to be able to, like, go and not get lost. I can't, like, just look at it. And... Not the way my brain works, but... Oh, hello. Anyways. And they, I have I have kids and and they like to come in. This is James. James. Hi, James. This is Greg Peterson, and he's an urban farmer. He has a farm in his house, and his house is a little bit bigger than ours, and his backyard's a little bit bigger too. But he's got how many fruit trees did you say you had? Um, I think they, I think last count was seventy four. He has seventy four fruit trees. I know, right? Wow. We just planted a bunch. You. Oh, cool. Yeah. I you hear you have hunt. chickens. You got chickens. He says, yeah, I hear you got chickens. Do you like your chickens? Oh, man, I love chickens. I have been keeping chickens for 15 years. So, Greg, t let's talk a little bit about chickens because, Perfect. you know, we, we love chickens over here. So Yay. Convince, the, convince the audience why they should have a chicken. Well, so here's the deal. Um, if, uh, here's uh, what I tell people is if you have a yard, you should have chickens because a permaculture chicken does um, much more than a standard industrial chicken we'll call it so in our culture what's a chicken good for M meat and eggs right meat and eggs meat and eggs in um, in my yard a permaculture chicken uh oh <laughs> that's all right in my yard a permaculture chicken um, I said meat and eggs and then it was your turn there you go so in my yard um, the chickens will eat the bugs They'll eat the weeds. Mm -hmm. They give me some eggs. They're great tillers, so they're great, you know, tillers of the soil, um, and they fertilize. So, do they don't eat your your actual like garden at oh, all? Oh, in a heartbeat they would, absolutely in a heartbeat. Use it. So you have to keep them separated from that. Oh, 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 oh. There yes. you go. that's yes. what I didn't yes. do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, there's actually something called a chicken tractor. A chicken tractor. Oh, I've seen those. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Those yeah, awesome. and a chicken tractor is basically a portable chicken coop. Just That's move really it around your yard. Okay. There's a book out there called Chicken Tractor. Um, so you just you know move it around your yard and like that. So really, chickens do a lot of the work for us. Um, in fact, I have. During parts of the year, the, uh, my chickens, my hens, run throughout my entire backyard. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So they're you know doing some of the mowing of the grass um, because they're you know they're pecking at the grass and they're eating bugs and weeds and they're fertilizing along the way and um, you know so they're they're really worker bees, worker chickens in our yard. So that's the biggest reason to have chicken. Um, really, 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 they're quite simple. Keeping chickens are so dang easy. Um, in fact, this little book here, this little book, see yes. how skinny it is? That's 92 mm -hmm. pages. Um, a friend of mine, oh, let me see if you can see this. That's Rachel. Nice. Oh. Um, she wrote this book, and what some of the feed stores here in town uh, call this book is the Bible for keeping chickens. Everything you need to know is in these nine, it's a four by, three by five book. Everything you need to know is in that book. On keeping Fantastic. chickens, they really are simple. It took me. Here's my story getting into chickens in the in the mid '90s. Um, I had a buddy of mine who had chickens, and I kept talking to him about them, and talking to him about them, and talking to him about them. And he, 
um, you know, he finally got sick and tired of me talking one day, and literally he brought me three hens, and he <laughs> said, here, deal with them. <laughs> and I, I quickly found out that chick chickens are so easy. Chickens <laughs> are easier than your cat. Yeah, they definitely are easier than the cat. Yeah. You know, it's really simple, and, you know, and then they give you eggs most every day. Which is Most the every cool day, one. and they're yeah. really friendly to me because I bring them food. Oh, yeah. Of course, <laughs> of course, absolutely. They love me. They're scared of my husband because my husband will spray them with the with the. Um, <laughs> he's gonna kill me that I told you guys, but he sprays uh -oh. them with the hose sometimes, nice. you know. Uh -oh. And I'm like, sweetie, you can't do this. They don't run to him, but the, whenever they see me, right. they run to me. Run you know, to like, you. Ah! Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's the lady with the celery. <laughs> right, exactly. And right. then I was talking before how, you know, I got this compost bin, this really awesome compost bin, right, and mm -hmm. realized very quickly that I'm not doing very much composting because the chickens yeah. are eating all the yep. food. Yeah. On but it property, makes me feel good. Right, that I'm exactly. not throwing anything away. Yeah. Right. Well, and what I do is I everything goes to the chickens, the grass clippings, um, all your kitchen scraps, every all the leaves in the fall. Oh, they can I do the them, grass clippings too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I give them all of that. Um, and then after it's been in there for a couple of months, then I rake it up and put it in the compost bin. And see, what they've done is they've added manure to it as well. I see. I okay. see. So, so we put wood chips in there. So maybe is that – would that – was that smart? No, that's fine. Yeah, but that's you can't really fine. rake anything out or. Oh, wood chips in with the chickens? Yeah. Yeah, that'll yeah. that'll change. I mean, it's like it's getting you know it becomes a chicken area. You know, we've got right. we've got this. We had these little igloo. You know, the igloo, the little the little right. English. So we had these little tiny igloo. Three chickens, just normal chickens. And then I was just like, I felt so sad for them. And I'm like, that's not that much room. Well, it's more than they'd get in a, you know, a factory farm. But right. So I was like, honey, that's not enough room for them. So we took this space of my house that is never used. And it's this, we have this big, huge tree. Well, around uh -huh. the trunk of the tree, this big, huge square around the trunk of the tree, we gave them a big, huge coop, right? And it was perfect because no one utilizes that space. That's right. Exactly. Perfect. And that's where they live. They have this good. big chicken coop. Yeah. You know. Good. They're happy Fantastic. chickens. Yeah. So why do I? Why did I get a little tiny itty bitty? Oh yeah, yeah, the egg? little tiny, tiny bitty egg. What's up that? With that happens sometimes. Just it's a you know it's just kind of one of those freaky things that happen. I had one. Of probably a year ago. No. And when There's... I when I I know and when I cracked here was the wild thing when I cracked it open, there was another one inside. I wish I would have been videotaping that because literally there was a regular size egg inside of this big one. So, you know, the, it's just, yeah, it's just freaky sometimes. Um, sometimes you know, people are born with six fingers. Sometimes the eggs are tiny. Like There you go. There you go. Uh, usually, what, are they brand new hens? Like um, got... Yeah, I got them this year in March and they they didn't start laying until June. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so sometimes when when you first get them and they just first start laying, the eggs will be a little smaller. In fact, I get this question all the time. People say, "Greg, you know how many how many eggs can I expect to get out of a hen?" Well, for the first couple three years, um, six eggs a week. Six then, eggs a week. Six eggs a week, and then the older they get, they'll lay less often, but the eggs get bigger. Okay, that makes sense. Right now, yeah. they're not laying very much. Like right. all of a sudden, they stopped laying. Yeah, it's getting a lot. colder. It's getting colder. The days are getting shorter. Um, okay. The the yeah the chickens are are tied to the day length. Interesting. They're yeah. awesome. They're awesome little things. They're my. They're they're really. I I call them my feather bitches. I don't know if I should be calling them that, but that's what I call them. Why not? My girlfriend calls her cats her fur bitches, and so yeah. I'm like, I don't have any cats. I got to compete. I got feather bitches. <laughs> <There> <laughs> I got go. three of them. And well, it makes sense though because in my home, I'm the only female other than those chickens. And there's right. three. There's I have three little boys and a husband, right? So there's four of them, and there's four of us. Ah, <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Because my Perfect. husband's like, you're outnumbered. I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not outnumbered here. Not anymore. No, no, no not anymore. Not anymore. So, so just a um, quick question from right, um, okay, question from Fabu Fabulous England. I'm in northern climate. I'm in a northern climate. Do I cut back overgrown 
only apple tree now or in spring? Let me read that. Does that sound right? That's okay. No, you prune you prune deciduous trees when they're dormant. Oh, okay. So they'll be losing their leaves here in the next thirty to sixty days, and you prune them. Um, you prune them when they go dormant. Okay, well, I'm sure that answered her question. Yeah. And I wanted to do a couple of shout-outs real quick and then go back to you, Greg. We also have some winners of your booklets, which is fantastic. Nice, fantastic. So, a couple of shout-outs. So, Sarah taught four fitness classes on Saturday. It hurts so good. She's done fantastic. Um, Joanna, can you put the rest of the shout-outs down below in the... Um, in the comments so that I can get to them. I'm going to go to the winners tonight of our four little booklets that um, Greg is going to be giving away. Winners, Tony Kerrigan's Joy is a winner of two of our booklets. Another winner is Amber BC, My Mama Say So. Congratulations, darling. Then we have Janae. Janae's a winner. Congratulations. And Gina, Gina Bad. We got some awesome people Ooh. that are really, really going to love these little booklets that you gave cool. out, too. Well, and the, here they are, real quick. This is what they look like. Um, that's my ordinary, extraordinary yard. This is a story about how the urban farm came to be. There's a little booklet on chickens called Foul Play, RR. Um, uh, one on, you know, different places where we have our gardens at. We can find gardens. And, and then uh, this is an environmental footprint measurement tool. Um, so oh, it's a quiz. That, it's a quiz that you take, and you'll notice that the books are small. Mm -hmm. They're mini right. books. I love my mini books. Um, the cool thing also too. is the cool thing also is is that um, we have an app coming out a week from Tuesday. Tell us about it. And these will all be in them. Ooh. So we're, yeah. So I'm actually we put an app, and it's called the Urban Farm Guides app. Um, and starting in January, we will, be, we will be putting out a new guide every month. So the like the Foul Play book has about 12,000 words in it and has some, mm -hmm. you know, some pictures and graphics and that kind of stuff. And it's, they're very instructional in nature. Right. Um, so the next one coming out in January is on composting. Awesome. Perfect I know. Timing. I know. The one in February is on worm composting. Um, we've got one coming out on edible flowers. Uh, so these are all just different topics. And, and a, a standard size book usually has about 80 to 150,000 words. So these mini books are, you know, about a tenth of the size of that. Um, and they're definitely instructional in nature. And, um, and we're wrapping them up and putting them in an app. So, so if we purchase your app, we'll have access to basically every single one that comes yes, out. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And the app itself is free. Um, and then the books, the guides, I'm calling them guides, the guides inside is, are what you unlock. Oh, got to get them all. It's like yeah, Pokemon. Yeah, you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we got, okay, so a couple Thank more shout-outs for tonight. Lydia um, lost another pound, bringing her total to 57 pounds wow, since April. That's cool. Congratulations, darling. Then we have, oh, that's my other cutie behind me. Then we have Megan. Megan Perry, per oh, Megan Parenthood started a 30-day ab challenge. She's on day five, but her endurance is building, and she's lost two pounds. Isn't that nice. awesome? Say yay, Megan! Yay, this Megan! Is my other one. Um, and then we have Gina. Gina Bad, her eight-year-old with autism, had a victory at school today. She was taught to pee in the potty at school and did it twice today. Mm -hmm. Huge victory for her for autism. We also, nice. my, I also have my oldest son that you saw before has Asperger's. So we, you know, mm. there's a lot of women online that have children with autism. And then we yeah. have Megan. NC Carter family can wear her 12-year-old son's jacket or a medium from Amber Crombie and Fitch. I got to tell you, this girl Megan has lost 120-something pounds. Wow. That you just heard. Good for her. That's why she's wearing her 12 year old son's jacket. Nice. <laughs> oh, no. Me Joanna, Joanna, help me out. She's lost 127 pounds. Ha that's a lot of weight, huh? That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of weight. This one I call Leucopotamus. <laughs> Disney yeah, he's, he's obsessed with Swap Force and Disney Infinity. Um, so you know you you mentioned you mentioned a really interesting thing and I'd love to come back on your show and talk about it. Um, there are so the environmental toxins that live in our culture anymore. Um, that's what's causing autism. It's what's causing um, a lot of the dis-ease that we have um, in our culture. In fact, I I, uh, I give a lecture here around Phoenix um, about our food and our food system, and I started by saying, listen. I say 100% of the disease that is in our culture comes from, from three things. Stress, environmental toxins, 
and the lack of nutrition in our food, and we have control over all three of those. Right. Um, go garden. Yeah. No, and you're speaking your own my food, language. You'll know Grace. what's in it. Yeah. We are so um, the Momovation campaign. Stop it right now. In I think it was April. Uh -huh. We turned into a detox campaign. So it Good. wasn't just about food, exercise, and fitness and stuff uh -huh. like that. It turned into personal care and cleaning products and indoor air quality and all the things that are toxic in your... Because what I learned was, and this really, to be quite honest, made me very angry, was... 90% of cancers are based on environmental toxins and uh -huh. what you're exposed to as opposed to what you just inherit. And right. so, oh my God, why are we spending all this money trying to find the cure? Why aren't we spending money trying to, you know, being being activists being and trying to fix yep. this problem yep. that we have because yeah. we don't need to have it. We really right. don't need to have it. Yeah, exactly. you got to come back on, and we got to talk more about that because it's like one of my favorite subjects. Yep. And as I can tell, you're probably a soapbox person, just like I'm a soapbox person. Oh right? yeah. I get up on my soapbox, and you know, people just can't seem to shut me up afterwards, and then they get really pissed off because once I get up on my soapbox and I get really, yep. really excited, it's 35 million impressions in 90 minutes, right, Good. guys? So. Good. It's Soapbox Heaven. We're going to be yeah, doing actually um, a Twitter party about, I know you guys don't know about this yet, but on, not next week, but the week after, no, it is next week, the week after that, oh, the 19th. We're going to be doing a Twitter party asking brands like McDonald's to stop marketing to children in social media and oh, digitally nice. Nice. because digital has taken over advertising. Right, and that's yep. where that's where they're seeing a lot. I mean, that's just where the future is. And right. they, those companies, have already said that they are not going to market to children, and we need to hold their feet to the fire because it's happening, and it's yeah. just not cool. But yeah. I'm sorry, Greg, I interrupted you. What were you saying? Oh, no, I'll okay. give you the final words. Me, the final word. Um, you know what? Grow your own food. Um, oh, here, here you go. Here's the final word. Do you realize that two thirds? of our fruits and vegetables come from outside of the country. That's according to the FDA. Two thirds of our fruits and vegetables come from outside of the, outside country. Of the country. And I bet you that are they oh look at this. Look at this. Show them the face. Well we can show them the face that you did. I saw that. Yeah, I what saw do you that. think what mommy Yes. Do you see my when I face my head this way? Yes. Yes, I know. You're very cute. <laughs> I think you're going to have your own show just like Mommy one day, right? Yay. Going to have your own show, and then you have an opinion. You put it out there, and nobody can say anything to you because it's out there, right? This one's my opinionated one. He, things Good. have to be a certain way, you know? Yep. He's just like Mommy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like me, too. So grow your own food. Yeah. Do your own thing. And if did you say three-fourths of our fruits and vegetables? or Two-thirds. Two-thirds oh, of our fruits I'm gonna and have vegetables a, come and there. And, they, and and tell tell everybody just real quick what happens when they bring them over here from over there. Like they're picked at what? Well, they're picked not ripe. They're picked not here's ripe. The, here's the thing. Remember one of the three things I just said that causes 100% of the disease in our culture? Lack of nutrition in our food. When you're picking a f fruit or a vegetable and it's not ripe, it's lacking nutrition. And the moment that you pick that fruit or vegetable, the nutrition that is in it starts going away. It starts degrading. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you're growing your own food and picking it ripe on the vine, that's when it is most nutritious. That's what we're missing in our culture. And when that's when they're cool. picking, when they're when they're growing something in Mexico or in New Zealand or in South America, they're prick, picking it not ripe, shipping it. Yeah. You oh. know they're shipping. Yeah, they're shipping and I, it. And, so and they're irritating it. Is it is it irradiating? irradiating? Irradiating. irradiating. I, keep getting, I keep getting that word wrong. I sat next to a physicist uh -huh. who works for the USDA on the plane. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that was his job, was to teach people up and down South America uh -huh. how to properly do that without oh, wow. exposing. Now, and here was the funny thing. That man seemed to think that, that was all fine and dandy and safe, but we kept talking about things. He eats all organic fruit, fruits and vegetables, all organic food. He sleeps with a naturopedic mattress because he's worried about the off-gassing. He yep. only uses cleaners that he and his wife makes himself, and he keeps his windows open all the time. 
and he's scared to death of the cell phone. He said he found out that, you know, I told him that, you know, women stick cell phones in their bras all the time, and he freaked out on me, and he's like, oh, my God, we need to have a meeting about that, because he was, like, one of the directors over there. And uh -huh. I'm like, do you know how many women stick cell phones Do in that. their bra? Yeah. You need to start studying this because this is going to be a big problem because it's happening all the time. And, right. and he said, oh my God. So yeah, that man said that was okay, but yet all this other stuff that people yeah, don't do. Yeah. Yeah. They, but, it's crazy. But, yeah, exactly. And I was just, I was blown away, but he's organic all the way. Never anything that's not organic. Oh my gosh. You know, and I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> but you're irradiating food. Go I know. figure. I know. Go figure. <laughs> but I thought that was really interesting about the, the mattresses. You yes. know, he even understands that, I mean, because most people aren't even aware of mattresses off-gassing and furniture right. off-gassing off and carpet yep. and all that stuff. He was very well aware of that. He bought all of, for all of his grandbabies, he bought them all Naturepedic and another, you know, because he was worried about that, being the physicist that he is, and his and his bed and his wife, you know, his ex-wife's bed and like every, and it's all about this mattresses and the carpets. There's no carpets in his house. Oh, yeah. It's all bamboo. Yep. And it, I'm just like, you are so cool, but I not at the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, he's missing a big one. He's missing a point. But hey, his entire life is based on that, so how can right. he not, you know? I guess so. I, you know, it's just a walking contradiction. It's like, it's like you know, it's like the GMO companies. They, you know, that's what they do for a living. Of course they think it's right. <laughs> oh, I've got one more message here that um, Megan had to stick in for her shout outs because I know, and I think maybe she just stuck this in just to see Greg Poor Greg turned bright red. Uh -oh. So, you know, Megan Carter has lost 127 pounds, right? She's still wearing the same yoga pants from 127 pounds ago. And she accidentally mooned her father-in-law today with her yoga pants. <laughs> <were too big. laughs> Good that she's doing yoga. <laughs> I think that's a good problem to have. That I've never mooned my father-in-law, but, you know, I kept get. You need new yoga pants. Megan, that's what you need. New yoga pants. Forget the yoga pants you have right now. I will buy you some new ones if you need to. Please uh -oh, stop mooning people in Northern Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Greg, it was so awesome to have you on today. So I'm, I feel delightful. incredibly blessed. Yeah. We want to have you back. We're definitely going to have you back. Everybody go to urbanfarm.org and check out Greg at The Urban Farm on Twitter and The Urban Farm on Facebook. And congratulations. And you can actually download this free book for free. Oh, and you can download that book for free. Yep. Fantastic. All right, ladies. I'm signing off for Motivation TV. Thank we will you, thank see you. you next Monday and have a great week. And go 522 in Washington. Woo Label GMOs. Yo. Oh, my God.